Hello, I'm James Fitzsimons and welcome to The Career Scoop, a podcast all about career progression, advice and experiences aimed at assisting those who are in career transition. Today, my guest is Endo Quinine, publisher and CEO of the Sunday Business Post. Enda has a most wonderful uh, uh, life experiences to date. At 21, he sailed on a makeshift boat from the US to Ireland, just to get home, he says. He also sailed in the 2017 Bondi Global Around the World Sailing Race, uh, which is a race that covers a distance of 41,000 kilometers, where skippers must go around the world through three capes, Good Hope, Lewin, and Horn, all without stopping and without assistance. Nicknamed the Everest of the Seas, and he sailed this on a 60-foot yacht called the Cacullan Voyager. And his business pursuits have included bringing credit facilities and cheap communication to Central and East European markets, uh, particularly the Czech Republic and Poland after the fall of the Berlin Wall. He's also an author of the best-selling book about his sea adventures, Journey to the Edge. And as said before, now he is the publisher and CEO of the Business Post. Uh, and uh, you're very welcome to the Career Scoop. Thanks for coming along this morning. Yeah, great to be here. <laughs> it's absolutely super. Uh, I, I'm sorry we're not in person, but unfortunately the, the guidelines at the moment uh, uh, don't permit that. It would be lovely to be sitting beside you and, and jawing away and hearing about your wonderfully interesting life. Thank you. Um, you, you might just kick off, again, this is a question I ask all my guests, but uh, you're, you're now a publisher and CEO of the Business Post, but you might just bring us to the, to the, the, the background from sailor, um, international sailor, East Europe, lots of other business ventures, and Sunday Business Post. So just the, the quick yeah, overview. Actually, actually, you know, life is a voyage, and, um, you know, it was the last place I expected to end up as the publisher of what is now the, the Business Post, and it's more than just a newspaper on a Sunday, of course. It's a data, digital, and software company. But, you know, get, getting <laughs> getting back to roots, um, you know, like everybody, I was born. <laughs> and uh, you set on the course. I was born in the, the west of Ireland, and um, I was one of a large family, and one could argue I was always in trouble. Um, I was expelled from school, uh, secondary school, and uh, the school wrote a letter home to my parents, and I intercepted the letter. So it was the last term, you know, this time of the year. So instead of going to school every day, I would go down around the docks and the harbour and my parents thought I was going to school and uh, the school thought I was expelled. Eventually it all caught up. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I was lucky in so far as that I, they did let me back to the school. I was really a troublemaker, perhaps with a small T or a capital T. And when I finished my uh, school, um, I, I sort of failed what was then the intercert um, but I sort of realized in the last six months that if I didn't get a decent leave insert, I would end up having to go out to work, uh, God forbid, when all my peers uh, were going to college. So uh, eventually I did get into college and I did a degree in, in Galway, a business degree. And then I went traveling. I traveled through South America, the Caribbean and the United States and had all sorts of um, adventures. And um, eventually I ended up returning to Ireland. It was a result of a wager in a in a sixteen foot uh, inflatable dinghy. It was an experimental sailing life raft, and and unbeknown to me, uh, it started an extraordinary life of adventure. Uh, I wrote a book about that trip, um, and as a result of that book, I ended up uh, meeting the then editor of the Irish Press newspaper in a pub, Tim Pat Coogan. And uh, he read my writings in the newspapers and the, then the Sunday press. And he offered me a job. So I ended up in the media. So <laughs> life, you know, uh, and, and, and now I've, I've gone the full circle, having been involved in many other different businesses. Indeed, I still am. So I think that's, you know, we're talking about careers here, but, but actually you have to be ready to take the opportunity when it comes. And then when you decide on something, you have to focus on go for it. I don't know if that makes any sense, James. It, it does. I'm curious because you, 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 from what I can see from a distance, I've known you probably for 20 years. I think we met for the first time in Prague many years ago where 
you uh, brought me or I think sold me tickets to a Hot House Flowers concert. Um, uh, I don't know how you became it. Obviously, you were impresario in Prague for Irish bands going over there at that stage. But fear, do, do you have fear? Like I know Salian's a very, uh, can be a very fearful place. Tell me about what fear means to you. Well, we all have different uh, levels of threshold relating to fear. Uh, yes, I do have fear. I think somebody who says they're, they're not afraid, um, yes, I, I do have fear. I think fear is a very good thing. Uh, you know, in a crisis situation, uh, you're, you, you get into top gear, you react faster and everything else. Um, so, yes, I do have fear. I think, you know, the person who says they don't have fear, they're not telling the truth. But then within that, there are levels of, of fear. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought anything when I was 20, 21, heading off and hitching around the United States. You know, I wasn't afraid of that. Um, I wouldn't have both thought anything about, you know, heading off in a little boat across the Atlantic because, you know, I'd done my preparation. So I've, we've different uh, levels of threshold of fears. And I think we all find our own level in life. And are, are there any kind of knucklehead stuff you're fearful of? I mean, you know, like you've been in storms, you've been capsized, you've been very isolated in fairly tricky situations. Are there any kind of stuff that kind of, oh, freaks you out, like cats or something like that, that sort of, oh, I'm fearful of that for some unusual reason? Uh, no, I'm a little bit claustrophobic. Uh, that's the only fear I had. Uh, I was in uh, the, one of the pyramids in Egypt in Cairo, and I got very claustrophobic. I was locked inside with a lot of people. And uh, I only realized that I had claustrophobia then. And I got stuck in a lift once. But again, one learns to manage that. Uh, it's funny. I had a similar experience in the Chichu tunnels in uh, just at Ho Chi Minh, Saigon, with a, 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 fr a friend of ours, Jacqueline Ryan. And um, yeah. they were bringing us through these uh, to show what, in effect, the North Vietnamese they had these tunnels on the ground to get behind the, their enemy lines, the Americans, and uh, we went into them. And these have been modified for our size. Gosh, it was very scary because there was no no going backwards. You had to keep going forward. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And a huge, yeah. overwhelming sense. And out in the sea, you may share some of those kind of very, very tough and very serious experiences. How, does it calm take over? You just, you, you've got to survive. Like if, if the waves are coming over or the, the mast is broken. You see, the ocean... Um, you know, the weather is almost like uh, human life itself, uh, you know, wild turbulence times, and you have other times that are very flat calm, and people's, our, you, our humor changes like uh, the weather as well. So well, what, what I mean by that is, um, you know, when you're on the ocean, we are but a drop in the ocean. You realize how insignificant we all are, but yet how significant we are because, you know, each drop uh, makes the ocean. Um, the second thing you realize is the absolute vastness of the ocean. And it's it doesn't hate you or it doesn't love you. It just is. It, 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 it's a physical thing. And it can be angry and have bad storms, but more often than not, it can be fairly mild and moderate. So what you realize is us as a drop, us as individuals, where that spark in that ocean, the, the ocean, you know, it, it has no um, sort of likes or dislikes. It just is. It's, it's a physical, it, whereas human life is just that next extra dimension. And, and it makes you think a lot about things like that, and it, particularly in the, the context of the vastness of the ocean. You know, two thirds of the world is, is covered uh, by ocean. And yet, United States, Europe, India, China, and the rest of the world combined is vast, but it's only sort of one third of the universe. So, so it is a very humbling uh, type of experience. Do, do you get to experience, I was going to say extraterrestrial, but out of body experiences on the water, things that are a little bit in different frequencies? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think you're, 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 you know, it is, it is a, that subliminal type of feeling, you, you, you sort of, the mind does leave the body, if you like, and you start looking at yourself. And we know so little about our own minds. Um, in fact, I think we're quite afraid of it, you know, because, you know, most of what we do is governed on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you stand back from that, when you're away from, you know, you wake up in the morning, you'll turn on the 
the radio or you'll read a paper or you'll have a coffee or you'll go for a walk. You're doing things physically. But when you're removed from those outside influences, uh, the mind is, is, is the most extraordinary thing. It's the most exciting an adventureful thing, but it's also a very frightening thing. And um, uh, there is no doubt that extra spiritual, it's it's that human dimension. It's, it's what we are in the universe, if you like. Are, are you a spiritual man or do you have views on? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, something that grasps me very deeply is the, the concept of eternity. Just think about it. You know, like God is a kind of a concept of imagining what you cannot imagine. It's certainly not what we've led to believe it is, uh, but it is something very spiritual and, and something very powerful in the universe. Um, and there is this drive of positive and negativity, the, the drive of good over evil, e, the good over evil. Um, so, so, so yes, I, I would have those sort of beliefs, but but not in the conventional sense. Would you have a sense, and that's probably going to be the question I'm asking? Um, do you think our souls are? Are, are kind of like rebooted like a like a you know like the, they pass through from life to life because it seems it's illogical that they get wasted you know what i mean they come in right they get kind of soul uh, 1.0 soul 2.0 and it gets passed along and you have past experiences that maybe shape us and give us our nature absolutely well look it, it is what we think it is you know <laughs> that's the the sheer nature of it you know time is is linear it's one dimensional but but if you if you abstract from that uh, it's it's boundless the possibility this whole concept of infinity and and uh yes there there there, there is something that it's 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 defining what we can to define it's not knowing what we don't know the known unknowns if, if you see them. the unknown unknowns if, if, if you see what i'm saying and all these philosophies and bring it into the work world how do you approach that what, who do you look to work with what type of people do you look like to look to, to well, recruit I'm, I'm I'm very fortunate in this stage in life. Um, you know, um, we have to make money, we have to live. Um, but unless I I really, you can't like everybody you work with. You know, a job is a job. But uh, what I look for as an employer, uh, I look for the skills. But really, it's passion. It's people who care about what they're doing, engage with what they're doing, and and respect the the people they work with. I think the whole nature of work is dramatically changing as as you probably know i mean that that's your specialization but work these days you know the linear uh, command and execute model um maybe in certain sectors but but now everybody is getting that level of education and technology really revolutionizes how we work it doesn't change the fundamentals uh, but on a personal basis i've got to a stage in life that um I'm not going to work with people I don't like. Uh, now, when you're younger in life, um, you cannot be as selective. So it's a privilege, I think, that comes with age. Uh, that, that, that's right. And and looking, so if you had a 22-year-old in front of you who's saying, I don't know what I want to do. This COVID is just doing my head in. What hope or what, what advice can you give them to say, just breathe and write, okay, there is a whole world ahead of you. The world will change. What would you say? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd I'd get out. Uh, I would travel. That's a fundamental. Uh, uh, you, you have to. It's that outside uh, stimulation. You get have to get outside your comfort zone. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is a lot of people go into careers by default because you know their parents did it or they know somebody who did it or uh, some personal connection. I think you have to go back to basics and look at, you know, what you want to do. Now, many people in their 20s don't really know what they want to do. Um, so for that reason, I think if you stand back and, and you know, I only really did it in my 30s. You know, I said, well, what sectors are growing and what sectors are in decline? So why go and, and learn a career in, in something that is in decline? you know, when you're at a, a crossroads. So find something that is growing and has prospects. Because once you start that career ladder, you end up in that sector. And very often it's more by accident than design. Um, so so in terms of advice, um, I, there are no hard and fast rules because we're all different. 
but I, I would also say um, that it's important to get into a a good company. What I mean by that is is a company that has good work practices, good values, and that has a degree of scale uh, where you can learn. Because if you're working in very small businesses, um, and and a lot most of the economy is in small businesses, but if you're in the early part of your career, uh, the best experience I had, again, I didn't get it till I was in my 30s, was working with some corporates and multinationals. Uh, and then I went back to being a small business person. And now, you know, the the, the, the Business Post group is, is growing quite significantly. It's becoming a bigger business, but it, it's a cycle. I'm not quite answering the question, but I think you get the gist, I think, of what I'm saying. I do. So it's maybe standing up. Maybe having a mentor, someone could reach out. Did you have mentors uh, besides the postman who gave you the letter uh, from school <laughs> back then? Obviously, you, had a, you, you gave him a, a backhander uh, to receive that. But you, did you have, do you have mentors or, or maybe you didn't appreciate they were mentors, people to say, and uh, listen, I think you're mad doing this or maybe you should do that. Or, the, or people just meet along the way and maybe people now could reach out to yeah. somebody who yeah. might. I, I think it was invariably people I met along the way. Uh, you know, I was a, I was a sponge uh, for knowledge. I was naturally inquisitive. Um, I think you've got to ask questions. Most people, if you ask questions, they will give you answers. But if you don't ask the questions, you won't necessarily learn anything. Um, uh, other than those who are professional uh, teachers, and, and no disrespect to the teaching profession, but sometimes those who can't do teach. Um, I, I think. If you go out in the real world and you meet people, so I wouldn't have had one magical mentor that I follow the route of, but I did meet a lot of people in my travels, and I I, I networked in the sense, in the bigger sense of the word, in terms of you weren't looking for something from somebody; it was that curiosity, and if you got something from them, great. Uh, but it was that it's just that innate curiosity as to how things work. How people relate to each other, how how business works, uh, how society works, and all of that. So, so it, it's it's curiosity and asking questions, and not being afraid to be curious, not be afraid to ask that question, which might sound very simple or stupid in a sense like that. But that's an opening. Yeah, I think that yeah, that does dovetail back into James, what you were talking about earlier, that concept of fear, not not being afraid. Uh, to ask that question and and some people shyness it's maybe fear is too strong a word they're just shy uh, lack the confidence but 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 you know you are respected if you do ask questions any funny stories you can share with uh, you know from your times in telecoms in eastern europe or obviously your travels uh, work wise i'm just kind of the the funny stories that you learn you take yeah. or even or even okay. mistakes um, you make that you say i won't do that again yeah um, a business I'm very proud of, it's not very sexy, but uh, we set up a credit bureau, which was a system for sharing credit information uh, between banks. And my my success, I guess, was in, in former communist countries, was looking at proven business formulas that worked in the West and transplanting them into former communist countries. So there was one particular uh, time uh, I developed this concept of a Czech credit bureau and a Slovak credit bureau, which was a system for sharing credit information between banks. Uh, but to get it to work, I had to get uh, the head of IT, the head of commercial and the head of legal from each of three of the seven major banks in the Czech Republic. So that was a group of over 20 people. And I had to sign off from the leaders of the banks because they know knew this was needed uh, for the banks to share information. And every uh, two weeks, we would meet in the Bankers Association and we would move this project along. And after about six months, <laughs> they were all mid-management. It was going nowhere. So I had long planned a holiday with my family. Uh, it was the millennium. So... I decided I was going to stop work for six months, come hell or high water. I had young kids. And I did. I went off to South America and, and we rented a boat and lived on the boat with my family. And I came, came back. This was, <laughs> I came back six months later and 
uh, oh, this was about 20 years ago, so we didn't have digital photographs, but before going to the meeting with all the bankers, meanwhile, my assistants were rolling the meeting forward. Before going to the meeting, I happened to pick up lots of photographs for me, you know, in the Caribbean or in South America or Christmas Day on the beach, that kind of thing. And I arrived in, I'll never forget, it was the uh, Bankers Association, this massive mahogany table. And you had about 25 people sitting around and every two weeks they would go to this meeting to move the project along. But it really wasn't moving along. You know, six months later, uh, they were arguing about miniature. It just wasn't, you know, it might have happened in three years' time. But that was their job, going to meetings. It was that former communist thing. So halfway through the meeting, I stood up and I banged on the table, <laughs> this mahogany table. <laughs> and all these bankers looked up. And if I was Czech, they'd have thrown me out the door. But because I was a foreigner, they sort of, you know, and I had a great suntan and everything else. And there's a lot of jealousy, you know, how dare he be away for six months. And I said, this meeting is cancelled. This project is it's going nowhere. And then I took out my photographs on holidays and I put them on the table and you know there we are in 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 Trinidad you know there we are in Tobago and and and, and there's Santa Claus and water skis you know the usual type of photographs <laughs> and and I said I called off the meeting and they were all horrified you know a year's work uh, but I did have a plan in mind and um, you know so they thought the project was called off but the plan was um uh, I, I convened an emergency meeting of the chief executives of the same banks. Now, some of these banks had, one of the banks had 16,000 staff, you know, they, they were involved in everything. And because I was foreigner, because I was different, and because it was unconventional, I get them all at, up at seven o'clock in the morning for an emergency meeting. Um, and it worked, you know, I said, and this was the message I said, what you guys have done have taken months and months, could have been done in two weeks. Just get a life. You can sit around. So, uh, you know, it's not a very funny story, but it, it was an example of, uh, and they talk about it to this day, uh, that how the project happened. You just have to be prepared to confront, uh, not be conventional and, and, and question and, 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 and go against the grain. Now, I took a great risk there. They could have all just thrown me out totally and the project would have been totally over. Um, but they kind of understood what I said, but I, but I had to do that. So you kind of read the room and it was the right thing to do. Uh, being, being Irish and maybe being neutral, does that help that you can kind of, or is that a, or is that a I facade? So. I, 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 well, not just in that particular case, not necessarily being Irish, it was being not Czech in that particular case. Um, so any any person from outside the country, because and in Ireland the same, you know, we, we will tend to listen to a foreigner sometimes quicker than we will listen to one of our own. We will tend to, you, you know, we would tend to put a foreigner on a pedestal and pull our own uh, to pieces. Uh, sometimes for good reason, I might add. <laughs> but 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 uh, being Irish wasn't a big factor. It was the fact of being willing to question and against the grain and, and follow gut instincts as distinct from the group norm. And and 95% of us follow. It's easier to follow. And uh, most people do that. And actually, we need people to follow. I'm very happy to follow when there's something worth following. But somebody has to lead. So I have this philosophy, sort of lead, follow, or get out of the way. And I'm a very good follower as well. And, and you have to be able to do that. You know when when you know there is uh, good leadership, uh, but but leadership very often is 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 lacking, and you get this sort of mediocre, if you like, and 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 we can see that all around us uh, in life. Uh, so you know leadership is about pardon the expression having balls, or lack of fear, or to be politically correct, have the ovaries. You know you have to be able to say this is what I believe, this is what I think, and you have to stand up for what you believe and what you think at the right time. Who are the good leaders that you've interfaced with or witnessed or have an experience of? And I know you've been um, close to the EY uh, Entrepreneur of the Year over the years. Just curious the type of people, uh, you don't necessarily have to name them, but I'm just curious as to what qualities and what, what resonated. Yeah, I, I, I think um, 
quiet leadership, uh, consensus leadership, leadership from behind. It's it's not your sort of uh, Second World War uh, army captain going over the hill and attacking the enemy and everybody follows him. I think modern leadership is about listening and modern leadership is about more being a, a coach and then listening and then taking that moment and driving it forward. Um, you know, uh, in the corporate world now, he's, he's dead, but Howard Kilroy was a man I had admired. You wouldn't know him necessarily, but he he he, he led uh, the Jefferson Smurfit group, uh, worked very closely with, with Michael Smurfit. Um, and I think, you, you know, you, one has to look to Gandhi in India, you know, as a leader, very, I think, humility. Um, and I think leaders come from the people you least expect. And also real leadership, you, you very often need a time of crisis for real leadership to come forward because um, a lot of people who, who have that ability, you know, they're very happy to let somebody else get on with it. Uh, uh, and and But unfortunately, in a time of mediocre times, you know, mediocrity gets to the top. And, and sometimes then we have a void in leadership. Can you learn leadership? Is, is it born or is it natural or is it learned um, in your experience or observation? I think you can learn. You can learn leadership. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, de- definitely. Uh, there are uh, uh, characteristics that you, you can definitely uh, learn. And, um, and I think you learn uh, by listening and, and overcoming you know, your and his confidence and, and all of those factors. But yes, it's, it's something that can definitely be learned. That's interesting. Share with us the business post and the added on um, parts of it, which are our social media, conferencing. You might just share 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 with our listeners who may not be aware, or the journey yeah, to you yeah. taking it over. Maybe I mean, obviously, you yeah. were a, a journalist in the past, and uh, is that is that where the drive came from? Yeah, well, look, it's a fundamental part of Western society, freedom of expression and independent uh, journalism. And um, I had uh, completed my dream, I guess. I had sailed uh, solo around the world uh, in a 60-foot boat. And I was also moving my base uh, back to Ireland. And I was told uh, three years ago that what was then uh, the Sunday Business Post was for sale and it was the last thing in my mind and I, I got some advice and the advice said keep away from it um, and when I read it because a lot of media has gone out of fashion because media is considered you know it's one of the first areas to be disrupted and it's coming right across with 5G and digital right across everything we do every single day but media and entertainment to a lesser extent were the first big areas to be disruptive and a lot of newspapers were in trouble and uh, for that reason people were reluctant and afraid to invest but what i saw was an incredibly strong brand uh, an incredibly group of journalists and and also a a value system Uh, because when you own a newspaper you don't actually control it you don't tell journalists what to write you're custodians of a value and a way of looking at the world. So what we did was um, we we looked into uh, Northern Europe, Norway, Sweden and Denmark, uh, particularly what was happening with media. We tend to look to the United States and Europe, but actually it's the smaller European countries. So we looked at the the business model. Uh, Obviously, we also looked at the United States, uh, discovered uh, Jeff Bezos had bought the Washington Post of Amazon, and so we have to meet this Bezos fellow. We didn't meet him, but we actually met um, Fred Ryan, the CEO. Um, Jeff Bezos, we discovered, had bought a house beside the Irish ambassador, an excellent ambassador, Daniel Mulhall in Washington. And through that sort of connection, we found a way to Fred Ryan, the CEO, and we met a lot of their technologists and their data scientists. And I thought we had cultural change issues in Ireland, but we realized that the future is, is you know, the business post, the Sunday business post, just for your own information, James, is now the business post and we're a 24-7 business. Uh, we've done six um, small acquisitions in the last three years that complement our strategy. And the strategy is we're developing it as a 
data, software, and services business. And, you know, we don't sell advertising in the traditional sense of the world. We build trust with communities in, in the different sectors. Um, we've, we've obviously got uh, strong podcasts. We've got um, uh, magazines. Uh, you know, we've taken over a construction magazine for the Construction Industry Federation. Uh, we have trade we have hospitality expo which is a major hospitality exhibition which is february next year so we've built out a whole model um that takes the, the success and the values of what used to be the sunday business post and um, we also uh, took over irish tatler magazine uh, which goes back now 131 years so we've created the business post group which is effectively a family of brands we've connected magazine in the newspaper in the software sector and the te technology area. We have food and wine in the food area. Uh, we have a company called Digital DNA, which which does uh, conferences and exhibitions and events. And of course, iQuest, Business Post Live. So so it's actually, people just think of us as what used to be the Sunday Business Post, but in fact, it's very exciting. We have a really great group of people that I'm honored and proud to be working with. Um, and we're, we're spreading the base of the business and we're also, you know, we want to be anything to do with Ireland and business uh, globally. So diaspora engagement is very important to us. We're doing events in the UK. We've doubled our digital subscriptions um, and, and we, we think we're delivering some amazing business content. We've doubled up on investment in journalism and we have a very strong editor in, in Richie Oakley. And, and really, I'm proud uh, to be working with that team. That's, that's a great story. And I know that Mark Benioff bought, of Salesforce bought the New York uh, New York Times. I think he's the owner of that. But that, that uh, where the world is going uh, from the point of view that people are on and people want quality information because we don't know where we're getting our information from a lot of the time, unfortunately. So something that has quality, is that really what you're, the essence, the backbone of the yeah. ethos of the organization? The, the, essence, the, essence, the essence of it is that the, the Business Post brand means trust. We have independent journalists. Uh, we're actually the, uh, look at, I'm all for international companies investing in Ireland and we will compete and we will do it better. But more by accident and design, I realized we're the only privately owned uh, national media company. Uh, RTE forms a very valuable role, but it's state owned. Uh, farmers Journal is a trust. It's, it's owned by the farmers, which is great. Irish Times is a trust, uh, a great publication. And, and we're, we're not competing with those titles head on. We're taking our own niche and our own specialization. So it's actually a big responsibility because somebody has to question, somebody has to have the freedom to question, uh, the commercial independence to question. And, and that's the real value proposition of the business post, uh, its independence. And in an era of fake news, democracy is really challenged because what you have on social media, if you have a, a mild belief in something uh, through algorithms, you will only get information that will confirm that belief. So you'll go more extreme in that belief, whatever it may be. So um, there's no independent person to ask the questions and put the content in a digestible form. Um, so it's it's a very, very, aside the fact that, you know, the business post for us is a business and the business post group. It, it's actually, you know, when you work in life, you, you want to make a real contribution uh, to, to a better world. And, and I hope through what we're doing with the business post, we can do that and, and make a successful business. Well, I, I really love that sentiment because I think it's, it's, it's well needed. Uh, and I, I, I talk to, you know, where you get your information from now is critical. And the, the, the sources you said, you're just not sure, and the algorithm will be pushing uh, pushing stuff at you that uh, you may not want to read. And some people don't know what they're not reading. I suppose that's probably what, what it's about. Okay, just one quick question on on, on the, the, the 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 post. Um, is the big issue about about um, presenting or talking about something or writing about something that you have to get a kind of so you have to get it right. Uh, so we're being sued from the outside. I'm always curious to ask someone in 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 your world. How do you mitigate? How do you how do you how do you uh, make sure you get it right? Um, well, 
the, the, the libel laws in Ireland are, are very extreme. Um, in fact, they're, they're too extreme. Um, we have a very expensive insurance policy. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is uh, we have uh, professionals who vet the, the stories, and that's the professional training. And then before going to press, uh, we have a professional barrister who, who uh, goes through the content uh, with the fine tooth comb. So it, it is vetted, first for accuracy and facts, and then for, for, for legal protection. So it's a very cumbersome process. It's a huge cost in our business, and, and we have to carry that cost. And then yet somebody puts a, a casual comment up online that may be totally false, and, and, they, you know, and people believe that. You know? So uh, I'm not saying we're perfect in our business, but we have a, a very sophisticated, refined uh, vetting process to protect us both legally and, and also the integrity of our brand. It seems unfair that you, that someone can just do it. And, and if you do it, you may get sued or, or a libel call. Well, it's totally, it's totally unfair. And, yeah. and, and that's why, you know, uh, uh, Google and Facebook, they're, they're billion euro companies. They're, they're, and, and good luck to them. You know, I, I don't think closing them down is the answer, but, but it's not a level playing field. It is totally not, and, and and that's why. And right, it's it's kind of we're killing it in plain sight, you know, uh, because we, we have tremendous local newspapers, local community papers, uh, 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 and and you know, media is is very very challenged, and you know, people wonder why you see the extremes in the United States, but your local newspaper is gone. So there's there's nobody to question the politicians, to question the police if there's an incident. They're getting away on skates. So the newspaper has been a part of democracy. So so you take in Minneapolis, you know, the uh, local paper and that they're they're disappearing. You know, if 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 a police was rough on somebody, the, the paper would write an article about it. But that's the paper is no longer economically viable. So there's nobody questioning. There's nobody asking those questions, and no laws can do that. It's it's a functioning part of democracy. You know, the people will may analyze it in fifty years' time, but it, it's happening in plain sight. Uh, by and I don't necessarily have the answer. You know. In Ireland, uh, Professor Breen McRae with the, the Future of Media Commission, they're trying to harvest all of the views. And, and I think we need uh, political leadership uh, to understand that. And, and that, is, that is a very big, real hidden challenge we face in society at the moment. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I, my hat, hat's off to, I think, what you do and what, what your organization, anyone who's prepared to go and write about and present uh, situations appropriately and give a fair view. It's, it's, well, look, it's, it's very you, welcome. You, you, you can get a subscription to the Business Post, a digital subscription, for less than the price of a cup of coffee every week, you know. And at what value, you know, uh, you wouldn't think twice about buying a cup of coffee every week. Uh, but, but you know, that's our value proposition. Uh, take a digital subscription. And, and the print copy... Um, we keep print as long as people want it, and our, our, the paper we print on Sunday is, you know, it's holding up. Uh, it's forecast to decline because people are going online, and and you know, it, it doesn't matter. We distribute it. We're storytellers. We're reporters, and and we're producing good magazines and and good newspapers. And but you know, you have to think about how you consume, and you have to make that value jump judgment for anybody listening to that podcast. Uh, and I'm not just saying it with our own product. I think, you know, decide w- what information source y- you're comfortable with and particularly also your interest area. Uh, you know, not everybody is interested in, 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 in business, um, but obviously the Business Post does cover the, uh, the culture and the arts but, but, and politics. But decide, is that coverage sufficient for you? And, and we'll be judged by the market and we'd like you to, to, to come on board. But if you don't, uh, do it with somebody else. But the fundamental message from this, from a career perspective, is uh, uh, you've got to learn. You've got to ask questions. I became a readaholic, and it's never been easier. At an instant, you can learn, ask questions about everything that's happening in the world. So from a, a career perspective, and, 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 and what this podcast is, is, is about, the opportunities have never been greater. But, you know, the, the flip side of that the risks are pretty significant as well. 
But I suppose if you put the risks in the right place mentally, there shouldn't there should be lesser risks because uh, you're better to knock on the door than not knock on the door because you don't know what's behind it. Yeah. In that sense, just a, a quick question. You, you you touched on it. I, I see you as a as a as one of the best networkers I know. Uh, how would you advise that twenty two year old to start networking? It's kind of easier now because you can actually network out online. Uh, whereas back in the old days, you'd have to get on the bus and go to town and meet someone for a coffee and and uh, or, or have coins to able to ring people to get through to people. How do you do? You want to talk about that? First, first of all, I don't even like the term networking. Um, Gee, I'm going to go out and I'm going to network. <laughs> I'm going to meet lots of people. We're going to do, you know. Uh, but it's probably the word that best defines. And, and to me, what it defines is, is that curiosity in people. I think networking is about meeting people. And it's about meeting people with no expectation, no ask or no agenda. I think networking is about learning about people um, and, and getting to know people and building trust, because uh, that's the greatest thing. We, we like to do business with, we like to deal with people who we are comfortable with. And it's very much how you make somebody feel. You know, you, 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 for instance, you, you, you might uh, be in a room, uh, you might have a drink, uh, you might have a chair to sit on, uh, but it's how you feel, how comfortable was that chair? How comfortable are you in the company of that person? And the whole sort of thing about networking is it comes from an innate curiosity and, and also a willing to give because the more you give, very often the more you get. And it's the philosophy, uh, and I keep it in life. I'm always happy to help people if I can with no expectation of anything in return. And, and that comes back to you in leaps and bounds if it doesn't fine as well but you have to have that philosophy so from a networking perspective i think it's it's like the theme of of this whole conversation is uh, the curiosity of questions but not not being selfish not for looking for an immediate benefit it may be something you know 15 years time it's very often happened to me you meet somebody and it clicks uh, and you, you you i remember that sort of situation and then then somebody's talking about something or remember so-and-so and and that person very often is very happy to get the call okay so not be afraid to make not the ask but to actually reach out because every 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 if it's reach out with authentic this if it's a younger person would you mind can you give me five minutes i'd love to pick your brains or you know you can do something for somebody and and everybody can do something for somebody so those younger people they could say someone had younger kids and they wanted a kind of a in early twenties, to have a chat with those younger kids, that could be that 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 offer, appropriate offer, uh, in, in that sense. So there's a there's a there's a big circle of 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 receiving and giving. Yeah, and 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 asking questions, but on, on listening, you know, um, what can you for that do for that person in their in their situation, you know, and having a bit of fun because you have to take what you do seriously, clearly, but not yourself seriously, you know, and oh. uh, and I think if that. If you retain that as a philosophy, it'll get you a long way. It might get you into trouble as well. But <laughs> no, but I, I, know ref- I know referred back to our, our hot hothouse flowers experience in, in Prague, but I don't think you realized that time. you made something happen for us and a bunch of other people. And, you know, you just said, sure, no problem. I, I was always indebted to you for that because that was just a fabulous night to the sense of, of people, Irish who are abroad and someone, a, a super band coming across and that just sense of, Connectivity, that sense of community. It's one of those things. It was a great, a great evening, and a very quiet evening. Of course, we're in bed very early, uh, as one does, as, as one does those things. Uh, my my last two questions, and I, I know you're 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 busy there. Workplace stress. How do you how do you? That's a word. Uh, people are on. People are on Zoom calls. We're all we're all, and sometimes, well, I know for myself, technology. You're on a call seven six seven. That tech, it's hard sometimes. So how do how do you think people can what do you do to kind of get yourself okay? I can breathe now, and I can can now go back to something. Well, I, I, I jumped into the ocean this morning. I uh, went for a swim. Um, I li- I ride my bike. Uh, the simple things in life. Um, I think a big reliever of stress is just getting out and about, uh, walking, um, and the, the simple things, and, and and that I think that's kind of obvious, uh, but but less obvious I think is 
is we all get caught up in the day to day and we all get caught in a very narrow our own world and we sort of have to and then try and just stand out from that just you know um, contextualize it think of you as just that drop in the ocean uh, you know somebody's worried about something but what does it matter you know who gives a toss or you know try and define what really matters and 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 um uh, it's easy for me to say it. I've been very fortunate. I, I, I've never had real stress in, in, in that real sense. Interesting. Five words to describe your career, if that's if that's enough, or two words. <laughs> no, I, I didn't actually think about this, but but uh, uh, I suppose ask questions, ask uh, adventure, be adventurous. Uh, risk take risks uh be humble i think i'm four words now ask adventure risk humble uh, humble and realize how, how insignificant we are in in the in the context of life and and um, and, and and the final one is 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 fun have a bit of crack have a bit of crack yeah don't, you know, do, take what you do seriously, but not yourself seriously. I and and uh, listen, I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's it's always lovely to meet you. I'm sorry we're not in person. I do enjoy your your company and your mind and and, and what you say. I listen very intently to it, and I'm sure our listeners will get a uh, a great uh, a great uh, um, yes, yeah, some great information to think about. And just so so for that subscription, just to do a small, it's. Uh, it's, this it's is, just this is post.ie. Post. You can have the, as an introduction, there's a newsletter that comes every day, which you can have for free. Uh, just Business Post newsletter, just Google search Business Post newsletter. And all you put in is your email address, and we'll send it to you free every day. And then if you like the product, uh, uh, it's uh, less than the price of a cup of coffee and uh, a week. And, and um, you, you can try it for a month for a euro and then if you'd, you'd like to stay with us stay with us so you know it's a club you join when, when you become a subscriber so it's very easy just businesspost.ie go online newsletter and uh, take it from there and I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to us today thank you for listening to the Career Scoop brought to you by Elevate Career Advice and Elevate Executive Selection Dublin and Bermuda I'm James Fitzsimons and I hope you've enjoyed listening join us next week for more episodes of the Career Scoop. Hope to see you there. Bye.